Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Master of Public Health program at Fresno State. Welcome to our webinar on nutrition and COVID-19 and um, the importance of nutrition in COVID-19. And uh, we have some wonderful presenters today. Uh, we have Dr. Miguel Perez, director of the MPH program. And uh, so I just wanted to welcome you on this, this awesome Thursday. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Rebecca Wass, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Uh, please direct all of your questions to the Q&A when able, and uh, we will address all of your questions at the end of the presentation. So right now, I would like to introduce Dr. Miguel Perez, Director of the Master of Pub Public Health Program at Fresno State in the College of Health and Human Services and the Department of Public Health. Uh, welcome, Dr. Perez. Um, it's, it's great to see you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Department of Public Health and the Master of Public Health Program of Fresno State, we would like to welcome you. I uh, really wish you a warm welcome to this uh, very important webinar on a topic that is uh, very close to our hearts, particularly in these times that we live. Uh, we would like to thank uh, Rebecca for her coordination of the event and also our utmost gratitude to the two panelists, uh, Karen Cohen and Irene Rios Rodriguez. I uh, look forward to this event. Thank you, Dr. Perez. So I'll welcome our first speaker. We have uh, Karen Cohen, uh, MPHRD, and um, from California Rheumatology and Wellness. Uh, she has been a public health professional and registered dietitian for over 20 years. She helps clients meet their needs as, as a supportive partner and educator. Uh, Karen doesn't put her clients on diets. She believes they don't work. And she helps her clients make small, realistic changes for their food plan over time to promote the best health possible while enjoying delicious and nutritious foods. She is currently working as an RD with uh, Dr. Verkdele in Fresno based, uh, and she's a, she's a board certified rheumatologist. Karen helps pa patients with rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune diseases help reduce their inflammatory, um, their, their inflammation through um, anti-inflammatory foods. Uh, she uses up-to-date nutrition research and keeps her patients informed uh, as far as which foods can be added. Um, uh, to their meal plan, wellness, and other domains such as uh, sleep hygiene, stress management, and exercise are also attended to. In June of 2020, Karen completed a certificate in contact tracing from the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Karen also received her, her um, nutritional science degree from Virginia Tech, her MPH from, the, from UC uh, Berkeley. Oh, and exactly. she has uh, three millennial children and a dog named Scrapper. In her spare time, she likes to hike, kayak, and read and sail. Welcome, Karen. Hi. Hi. Uh, good evening, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. I can't see you, but I know you're out there. Thank you for taking this hour out of your um, busy lives and watching the presidential returns. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be talking today about the coronavirus and what we know so far uh, about the coronavirus and nutrition. And in the last eight months, the coronavirus has really shined a spotlight on some of the long-term chronic health problems that our nation is dealing with. And we have been dealing with for many decades, but they've be become more acutely aware 
during the coronavirus and COVID-19 pandemic. And when I was doing my um, contact tracing class at Johns Hopkins, they mentioned a list of risk factors for serious infections from COVID-19. And I'm gonna list several of them and then discuss the ones that are diet and nutrition related and how we can improve our food pattern and the foods that we eat to lower those risk factors. So that if we do unfortunately happen to get COVID-19, uh, we will, we hopefully can have a, a less severe course of it and um, heal quicker. Um, but I still recommend, you know, facial coverings and social distancing and plenty of hand washing. But the nutrition ideas and concepts I'm going to present are in addition to, to those, um, those standards. Uh, so the first risk factor for COVID-19 is uh, being over 65, uh, and that increases your risks of severe COVID-19 increase with age. Diabetes uh, type 1 and type 2 are risk factors for severe cases. People who are obese, and obesity is defined as a BMI of 30 or over, People that smoke cigarettes are at higher risk of a severe disease. People with high blood pressure, lung disease, such as COPD and asthma. People that have heart, liver, and kidney disease, sickle cell anemia, and autoimmune diseases. And especially uh, individuals that have had solid organ transplants, as they're taking uh, many uh, medicines to, uh, um, to not reject the organs, so they're very immunocompromised. Uh, but of, of the risk factors that I mentioned, many of these risk factors are modifiable, meaning that we can do something about them. We can change our behaviors, our habits, and our lifestyles, and we do to some degree have control over these uh, risk factors. Um, the only thing, the only risk factor we don't really have any control over is our aging. We're going to, we're going to age no matter what. Can't change that. And it's nice to know that there are things we have control over in this frightening, stressful time. Um, but I do want to talk about one modifiable risk factor that's becoming very important in terms of the mortality and morbidity that it's causing and that is um, obesity. The most recent stats for obesity were in 2017 to 2018, and um, about 42.4% of adults were considered obese, and about 9.2% of adults were considered severely obese. And it has been going up steadily over the decades. Um, and the prevalence of obesity is more is highest in non-Hispanic blacks. And the CDC stated that adults with excess weight um, are at greater risk of severe illness due to COVID-19. Some of the stats that the CDC mentioned were that obesity may triple the risk of hospitalization due to the COVID-19 infection. And as your BMI increases, your risk of death from COVID-19 increases. And this happens in many different ways. One, sorry about the dog scrapper is barking. Um, one of the ways that obesity affects your health with COVID is that it decreases your lung capacity and your lung reserves, and it can make ventilation more difficult. And, fr and this is alarming. But some studies have shown with previous uh, influenza, hep B, hepatitis B, and tetanus that people that are obese uh, don't do as well with a vaccine. It may not, they may not get the response that we want because of the obesity. So as we are developing, as scientists are developing a vaccine for COVID-19, 
we 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 don't want that to happen. We want the everyone to get the same benefit from the vaccine. But however, uh, uh, people that are obese, uh, so far, given uh, other um, contagious diseases that they have been vaccinated for, it, there it's not as effective for obese people. So those are many reasons why I really want to bring that this topic up, um, obesity. It, it is a modifiable risk factor, and it's very, very serious and costly, and uh, we, can, we can do something about it. In addition to just obesity being a risk factor, it also causes other diseases that are risk factors for COVID-19. One of them is heart disease, uh, it could be atherosclerosis, from a high saturated fat diet, hypertension or high blood pressure, strokes, and type two diabetes is uh, related to obesity. And it's a risk factor for severe COVID-19 cases. And that is also a leading preventable cause of death. And how obesity causes, or the mechanism that scientists believe uh, appears is the uh, obese person has extra fat cells, and those fat cells produce a chemical called adipokines, which causes inflammation, and it affects the function of insulin. And the insulin doesn't uh, behave properly. It doesn't act, the action is not what it should be. So when you decrease obesity and decrease weight, it doesn't always have to be much weight, but you have fewer adipokines secreted, and that enables your inflammation to go down, and also um, your insulin will start to regulate itself properly. So that seems to be the connection between, you know, at a simplistic level between obesity and type 2 diabetes. What we eat, obviously, plays an important role in how our immune system functions. And uh, Hippocrates said it well 2,500 years ago that food is thy medicine and medicine is thy food, and that is still relevant today. So what we eat plays a big role in how our immune system works well, and if we don't eat well, if we don't have a healthy diet, it doesn't work well and can cause us to become sick. The Western diet that most Americans eat is also called the standard American diet or the SAD diet. And it's known as the SAD diet because it's very high in saturated fats, very high in salt and sugars, refined carbohydrates, and higher in calories. What it's missing what we're missing in the standard American diet is um, fiber. We don't get enough fiber in our diets. We don't get enough unsaturated fats in our diets, and we're low in antioxidants. So these factors weaken our immune system. So what we need to do is try to improve on that, lower the saturated fat in our diet, increase unsaturated, increase the fiber, lower salt and sugar, lower refined carbohydrates, and generally try to avoid highly processed foods because they have all of those components in them. They're full of salt, fat, and sugar, and all kinds of other garbage that you really don't want to put in your body. Uh, so before... I begin talking about the food that we would recommend. I want to do a quick, simplistic uh, talk or, or just tell you a little bit about the immune system. And we're exposed to pathogens every day, and we don't even know it as we have a well functioning immune system. So we, we hopefully don't get sick very often. But our immune system is working every day, uh, and we don't, we don't know it unless we get sick, and then we might get a fever, we might get inflammation, you know, then the immune system starts talking to us. And the immune system is a system of, it's a network of um, intricate stages and pathways that attack bacteria, viruses, parasites, and certain diseases. And there's two types of immunity. 
there's part of your immune system is called innate. And innate is the first line of defense for your body. So if you look at your immune system as an army, uh, these would be the first forces that the pathogen would encounter. And the innate immune system is achieved by having protective barriers that stop the pathogen. So for example, your skin is part of your innate immune system. Um, mucus in your nose and in your throat and mouth trap pathogens. And if a pathogen gets in to your body and gets down into your abdomen or I mean your stomach, you have hydrochloric acid in your stomach, which hopefully will destroy the pathogens. And in addition, your uh, sweat and tears even help your immune system. They contain enzymes that um, help create antibacterial uh, compounds. So all those areas are, are, called the, are called the innate immune system. And then there is an immune system that's more complicated and that's called the adaptive or acquired immune system. And it learns, it actually adapts or acquires by learning about a pathogen and what pathogen it struck before and it has a memory and it will go after that pathogen again. And the acquired immune system is regulated by cells and organs in the body. Some of the organs that are involved are the spleen, the thymus, uh, lymph nodes, so it's very complicated. And what happens in uh, the adaptive immune system is uh, a pathogen or a virus or a bacteria uh, comes in to the body and the um, innate, I'm sorry, the acquired immune system starts to create antibodies in response to the pathogen. And then those antibodies create cells and uh, they're white blood cells, and there's all uh, different kinds of, of white blood cells that are produced. The white blood cells find that pathogen, they attack it, and they destroy it. And it doesn't, and then they fade away. And when that pathogen comes back again, the acquired immune system remembers it, knows what antibodies to produce and what white blood cells to produce and that it attacks the pathogen much quicker and more efficiently. So that's why it's called acquired or um, um, adapted because it actually learns how to go after the invaders again. So that's a short, really simple explanation of the immune system. And interestingly, the immune system is affected uh, by what we eat. And there was a specific study that I read about, and it was it used mice. It was a mouse study, an animal study, and they consumed saturated fat in high amounts, or saturated fatty acids. And what they noticed was there were increased macrophages that infiltrated the lungs, especially the alveoli, and when you have too many macrophages infecting the lungs and the alveoli, like we saw in COVID-19, um, the lung tissue becomes inflamed and is damaged because you have too many lymph, uh, um, I'm sorry, white blood cells and macrophages going to the lungs. And they think that that same uh, process that happens in the mice may also happen in humans um, when you're eating a high fat diet because it happened in the mice when they used, when they fed the mice high quantities of um, saturated fat. So just that one, one nutrient or, or one area of the diet had a very significant uh, effect on the mice and probably part explains or could explain why there's a high rate of infection in the lungs of um, COVID patients. And the standard American diet uh, has also been shown to inhibit lymphocyte function in your adaptive immune system. So when it's inhibiting the adaptive immune system, your diet, uh, the lymphocytes aren't being made and they're not pursuing foreign substances. So it limits some of the white blood cells. Now I wanna talk a little bit about what nutrients do we need 
to keep ourselves healthy and to keep our immune system working well? Well, we need a lot of vitamins and minerals to work in coordination. Uh, vitamins, we need vitamin A, the B vitamins like vitamin B6, B12, folic acid, vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E. So A through E. Those are the, some of the vitamins that we need. Minerals are also important. We need zinc and selenium and iron. And protein also is important because that's what the cells use uh, to grow. The immune cells need protein to grow and function. Um, so the diet plays a large role in determining the kinds of microbes also that live in our gut. Even the bacteria in our digestive tract, in our intestines, uh, the bacteria produce um, immune compounds. And that's fairly new, maybe 10 to 15 years ago, they, their research was started on the microbiome and in, in the uh, intestines and how that also affects immunity. And the microbiome basically represents trillions of microorganisms that live in the intestines, and they play a key role in immune activity and in production of antimicrobial proteins. So who knew? Even in your gut. That's why it's often, we're often told to try and, and eat pro prebiotics and their foods, uh, fruits and vegetables and, and legumes and whole grains, those foods are digested by the uh, bacteria in your gut and they're used for food and fuel. And the, that food and fuel helps to repopulate the bacteria, the colonies and keep them healthy so that we have more good bacteria in our gut. And then you've probably have heard of probiotics and those are foods like um, yogurt and they contain live bacterial cultures of the good bacteria. So you're actually eating the yogurt and eating the live cultures and they repopulate your gut. So if you've been sick and um, you want to repopulate your gut with good bacteria, if you eat yogurt or kefir, uh, that they have the live cultures and they're uh, the good bacteria. When the good bacteria die, the bad bacteria take over. So um, that's how the gut microbiome basically works. The kind of diet, and I hate to use the word diet, but I would say um, a food pattern that's most, uh, I've seen in more research over the last 10 years, that I can confidently say that we should try to lean towards a plant-based diet, preferably with whole foods, minimally processed, and mostly eaten at home. Uh, when we eat out, at restaurants, you know, we don't know what's in our food. There's lots of salt, fat, sugar. Uh, so that's why you have more control over your food when you eat at home. Right now, Americans eat a lot of processed foods. And that would be, they would be foods that are in a box, a bag, a, a tin. And you look at the ingredients and you can't, you can't even see to the end of the ingredients. There's maybe 15 ingredients. And pronounce and you don't know what they do those are highly processed foods and they're you know we can think of all kinds of examples potato chips and um well, cakes and cookies and, and deli meat highly processed hot dogs um they would all be considered highly uh, processed foods and we want to try to get processed foods where there aren't that many ingredients in in the food uh, now I'm going to just talk about um, sorry, what kinds of fruits and vegetables we want to eat because that's the mainstay of a plant-based diet are fruits and vegetables. Uh, as many as you can, fresh or frozen fruits and vegetables in a multitude of colors that look like the rainbow. Have a fruit 
or two servings of fruit at every you know, breakfast and snacks, have a, a, a vegetable as incorporated into your snack. Try to have a vegetable or fruit at every meal and it's snack time so that you can increase the a variety of fruits and vegetables because those are very important. They have the vit vitamin A, vitamin C, antioxidants, fiber. They're really, really, really good for us and Americans don't eat enough fruits and vegetables. I have, I have a little tray that I made up. I'll tilt this up and see uh, if you can see this. I have a tomato on my plate, asparagus, onions, banana, kiwi. Um, red, green, yellow peppers. So the more colorful, the better. And another food group that's important in this plant-based diet is um, to eat a lot of nuts and seeds. And I have, uh, um, if you can see these, I have some walnuts in this little jar, in this little bowl. Walnuts are great. Almonds are, are wonderful. Lots of antioxidants in them. Uh, nuts and seeds. I have pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds. They're all good to, to, to nosh on. Uh, get the unsalted nuts and seeds so that you don't have to worry about you know, your, your blood pressure going up. And if you can buy nuts, uh, if you can get them roasted without oil, that's the better kind to get. So nuts and seeds are very good for you. And the next food group uh, I wanna talk about are beans and legumes. This is a little hard, I'm not sure if everybody can see this, but I have a little glass here of legumes. Uh, these are brown lentils, they're dried, so you'd have to cook them. And then I have some red lentils here, and then I have a couple cans of beans. Uh, and they're called legumes. There are kidney beans. It's not, it's a little bit hard to see. Kidney beans. Ah, I can't get it in. Well, I'll just tell you. Kidney beans, garbanzo beans, black beans. Those are all really great foods to incorporate into your diet. They have lots of protein, lots of fiber, and lots of vitamins and minerals. And they're low in calories and they have no fat. So you can add them to stews or soups or salads, or you can make a meal. Uh, vegetarian meal with beans. Next, we have uh, the whole grains. And when I say whole grains, I am talking about things like farro, which is really high in um, fiber and low in well, no fat at all, very high in fiber and B vitamins. And then there's other grains like couscous. You can get whole grain couscous. That's a good alternative to spaghetti or pasta. Uh, oatmeal, for example, is a really a good grain. It's a high, high fiber grain. It's not processed. And when I look on the ingredients, all I see is 100% whole grain Irish oats. Uh, I even have some pasta that counts as a legume because it's made from chickpeas. And this is called banza, and it's made from chickpeas. So you're getting pasta, but you're not getting all of the calories, and you're getting lots of protein and fiber. So this is a good alternative to regular pasta. And it tastes really good. Next, I'll, look, I'll show you my, what I eat in the morning, which is shredded wheat. Okay? Every morning I eat it, I put some blueberries in it, fresh blueberries or strawberries. I chop up a, a tablespoon or so of, of walnuts. But here is the shredded wheat. And when I look at the ingredients, the only ingredients are whole grain wheat and wheat bran. That's it. So this is a minimally processed food. 
okay? It only has three ingredients. And one of them is BHT, which is a preservative. Other um, foods to try and incorporate into your diet would be the healthy oils. Uh, olive oil instead of butter. You can saute with it. You can put it in salad dressings, but try to avoid using butter. So here's some olive oil. Uh, walnut oils are good. Nut oils are good. Canola oil. They even have avocado oil. So the, these oils are high in um, omega-3 fatty acids, which, which are anti-inflammatory uh, fatty acids. So these are wonderful. Try to uh, get away from using a lot of butter. Lot yeah, of yeah, yeah. That's it. Oh, was that? I don't know. Okay. And the last um, food I would like to, or it's actually not a food, but a beverage to avoid, actually, is alcohol. Uh, I haven't talked much about alcohol, and uh, I know that it, we, during COVID, I, I think many of us were having a little bit of extra alcohol to relax, but you want to keep that to a minimum because it does affect uh, your absorption of nutrients, uh, the bioavailability of nutrients, and it does cause inflammation. So also keep an eye on your alcohol intake. And I have uh, a label. Do you, do you have the label, Irene? Um. Oh, here we go. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you, Irene. Um, Irene put up a, a nutrition facts label, and that's really important. In order to improve our food intake, we have to know how to read labels. Uh, the, the United States is not very um, honest, in a way, about labels. They're not very transparent, so we kind of have to be little scientists to know how to read a label. First thing you see is the serving size. And every Nutrition Facts panel will have a serving size. And everything that follows the serving size, uh, I mean, all the, all the items on the label that follow are based on that two-thirds cup. So that two-thirds cup of whatever it happens to be has 230 calories. If you doubled the serving size, you would have to double the calories to 460 calories. Some of the important things to notice on your label are um, – saturated fat and the total fat but saturated fat especially and this one just has one gram uh, trans fat has been removed from most food products it was very very bad for you and sodium well, some people have to keep you know keep an eye on their sodium we all should really for um, our blood pressure dietary fiber is is good if it's over three three grams or more Per serving, that's what you want to shoot for is at least three grams. And uh, protein, the higher the better. And the nutrients that are listed are vitamin D, calcium, iron, and potassium. So that's what you need to do. And if you see sugars, so this food has 12 grams of sugar. Well, we don't know what that means because most of us don't use the metric system. But... There's four grams of sugar in every teaspoon. So that means that this food has three teaspoons of sugar in it and just two thirds of a cup. So when you see the grams of sugar, divide by four and that tells you how many teaspoons of sugar are in that food. And this food includes 10 grams of added sugar and the labels are going to start to include um, added sugars and be more, a little bit more transparent and I think they're going to have to put it in teaspoons instead of grams, which will be really helpful. All right. Thank you, Irene. Uh, my last subject is um, supplements. A lot of companies are um, putting out supplements, getting them out on the market for COVID and immunity 
and they're taking advantage of our fear and they're taking advantage of our pocketbooks. Right now, there's no good evidence that studies, uh, I'm sorry, that supplements do any good for COVID-19. Okay, they're not approved by the FDA and there's no evidence that any of these supplements work. I looked in my Costco magazine the other day and I found at least six ads for vitamins that help your immune system. Vitamin C, vitamin D, help nourish your immune health. Um, so it's everywhere. This is a zip fizz for immune health. Um, you don't need to buy these. There, there's no evidence that these are going to help you. It's better to get your vitamins and minerals uh, from food first. If you need to take a multivitamin just as a backup, go ahead and get a, a multivitamin and mineral supplement that has 100% of the RDA, and that, that helps cover any low par parts of your diet. Just a regular multivitamin, and it shouldn't be more than about $40 for a six-month supply. And one other thing to note when you do buy a vitamin is to look at the bottle and make sure that you see either USP on the bottle, and that stands for United States Pharmacopeia, or GMP, Good Manufacturing Processes. If you see either one of those on the label, you know that it's been, a, it's been tested by a third party, and we know what's in it. If it's 1,200 milligrams of vitamin C, we know that those, that's what the supplement contains, and we know that there's no impurities or toxins. So if you get the vitamin, multivitamin and mineral supplement, try to look for that USP symbol or the good manufacturing symbol. The only vitamin that has been talked about in COVID circles is vitamin D. Um, there is some evidence that vitamin D helps keep uh, your upper respiratory tract healthy. There's no studies right now confirming its use in COVID. But people that are low in vitamin D tend to do better uh, when they take a supplement if, they're gonna, if they are exposed to an upper respiratory flu or something. So I would recommend that probably most people could take 1,000 to 2,000 international units of vitamin D safely, or you can check with your doctor and have your blood levels checked. Um, if you're darker skinned, uh, you don't, the melanin in your skin prevents the sun from getting into the skin and making vitamin D. So you can, you might, you might need up to about 4,000 international units if you're darker skinned. Zinc has also been mentioned uh, as a cure, a cure for, or a supplement that limits COVID. And there's really no evidence to suggest that that does anything. Although I've heard people take zinc lozenges, just the lozenge, not an actual supplement, and that may help if they get an upper respiratory tract infection. But the, the jury is out. But there are about 30 clinical trials in process right now for vitamin D and COVID. So we'll know more in a couple months or a couple years. That's all that I have for today. So. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. This was awesome. So much amazing knowledge. And um, I mean, the vitamin D is really, really interesting, especially this time of year when the sun goes down a little bit earlier. Um, right. So, so I'd like to introduce uh, Irene Rios Rodriguez. And, um, she is uh, an alumna of uh, Fresno State and the College of Health and Human Services and the MPH program and the dietetics program. So we're, we're so thankful to have her here today. She currently serves as a clinical dietitian for the neonatal intensive care unit at Community Regional, Community Regional Medical Center in downtown Fresno. Um, she was raised in Clovis, California and graduated from UC Davis with a BS degree in clinical nutrition. She also earned her MPH at Fresno State, like stated before, and um, she's worked in the public health and community nutrition fields for a nonprofit, federally qualified health center, 
and taught bilingual diabetes management and prevention classes to hundreds of individuals in Fresno County. Irene is a certified lifestyle coach for the CDC Diabetes Prevention Program. And during her free time, she also volunteers with various nutrition programs throughout Fresno County. So thank you so much for being here, Irene. Uh, we really, we really appreciate uh, you taking the time out today. All right, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you, Karen, for starting us off with some great information. Um, so I'm just going to summarize a little bit about what um, Karen was talking about in terms of immune system and COVID. And then I'm going to discuss a couple more um, uh, topics regarding barriers and um, health disparities in our communities, um, healthy access to foods and things like that. Um, so as Karen mentioned, uh, eating and feeling healthy can truly help combat COVID-19. Um, good nutrition impacts our immune system through gene expression, cell activation, and signaling molecule modification. And uh, many nutrients are determinants of gut microbial composition and the shape immune, um, and they help shape immune responses in our body. So what we eat can truly affect how we feel and how our bodies um, respond to illness. So um, mentioned earlier was the Western diet, a diet that's full of um, saturated fatty acids, refined carbohydrates, sugar, and low in the good stuff, low in the fiber, unsaturated fats, and antioxidants. And when we think about um, our comfort foods, they typically fall into this category of the Western diet, foods that are fried and processed, heavy, um, tons of sugar. And these types of foods we have found can trigger inflammatory response, um, oxidative stress, and can ultimately lower our immune system. So the National Institutes of Health uh, recommends to limit these foods, right? And as Karen mentioned, a plant-based diet is really um, beneficial to us. And the Mediterranean diet also includes um, these really healthy nutritional components, such as olive oil, fresh fruits and vegetables, protein-rich legumes, fish, whole grains, and moderate amount of uh, wine and red meat. So overall, uh, consuming a balanced diet can boost our immune system and help um, combat this virus. So as Karen mentioned, um, tons of food choices that we can help boost our immune system. I'd like to talk a little bit more about the barriers to healthy eating or to starting these healthier lifestyle habits. Um, and the first I'd like to address is emotional eating. So this is something we've all experienced at some point in our lives, maybe currently, um, and maybe especially during this time of, um, of self-isolation at home. So healthy diet habits can help maintain physical and mental health. During this time of self-isolation and lockdown and social distancing, um, all of which are being recommended to flatten the curve, um, they, these same measures can have severe repercussions on our health as well. Um, it influences our eating patterns, our sleeping habits, and um, our physical activity. Um, many of us have become more sedentary throughout this isolation. Um, we've developed anxiety, and just this anxiety of staying healthy um, may be what is influencing us to be unhealthy, to eat unhealthy, to have less of a desire to eat, or less of an enjoyment with eating, or causing overindulgence uh, with these comfort foods that have you know, little nutritional value to us. Um, so emotional eating includes eating out of boredom, stress, and decreases our physical activity. So eating out of boredom, we know we're bored to fill our time, we're gonna eat. We're gonna munch on something that we have in the house, in our pantry. Um, overall, eating out of boredom increases our consumption of fats, carbohydrates, and protein, all of which are necessary nutrients, but um, when it's overconsumed, it's not healthy for our well-being, especially in the long term. Um, and with eating out of stress, stress pushes us to overeat as well. Um, stress can cause us to search for our comfort foods, which tend to be the unhealthier foods. And stress can also induce cravings. So when we look at cravings, um, 
Craving is more of like, it's a multi-dimensional concept. So there are four different parts to it. There's an emotional part, which now the next time you have a craving, you're gonna think about these steps of what you're going through. Um, the first part is emotional. Uh, it's the, that intense desire to eat. You think about that one food and you're, you're starting to obsess over it. It becomes behavioral. You're gonna start seeking the food. Do I have it in my pantry? Is it in my house? I wonder if the grocery store is carrying it this week. It becomes cognitive. So the over-consuming thoughts of the food, you almost become obsessive about obtaining this food item. And then the fourth is physical. You're actually going to start salivating. Um, and that's a physical response to a food craving. So stress causes... Um, those four responses for a craving, which is pretty interesting. Um, also, the decrease in physical activity and being outdoors, as Karen mentioned, um, vitamin D previously. So less time spent outdoors also means less time in the sun. Um, the sun is also another opportunity for our bodies to create vitamin D. Vitamin D um, production is reduced when we don't get enough sunlight. And vitamin D is extremely important for many, for many metabolic processes um, in our bodies. So how to combat these eating patterns during this time of COVID and beyond? So I'm just going to go through a couple of tips that seem simple and easy. Um, however, they can be challenging as well in our daily lives. So the first is to surround yourself with as many healthy foods as possible that is within your availability and within your budget. Um, if junk food is the main food item that if you can just not have in your house, that would be my first step, especially um, if there's food insecurity or um, those barriers. So, so if junk food isn't around you, if it's not in your home, uh, we are less likely to eat it. We're less likely to seek it. So that would be my first tip. Um, the second is to have fruits vegetables, whole grains, and low-fat options on hand for snacking, especially for snacking. Um, these fruits and vegetables, whole grains, low-fat items, you can find them either frozen or fresh, whatever might be affordable to you in your household. Um, and the next point is eat comfort foods in moderation. So don't completely deprive yourself of what you enjoy, what what makes you happy, uh, we just do need to practice self-control with this. So if eating ice cream brings us joy, um, eat the ice cream, have a scoop or two, but completely, like, completely eating the container once or twice a week, that isn't an unhealthy, unhealthy habit. So really practicing the self-control, especially during this time of chaos, treat yourself, um, just have that self-control of moderation. Um, the last point is to move, move, move. So give yourself permission to move. Give yourself permission to take care of yourself, to step outdoors, to get fresh of, a breath of fresh air. Um, now is the time to really focus on your mental health as well. So being physically active um, outside, not on, outside or inside, not only helps use up some energy and burns fat, but it also boosts our mood too, um, as well as getting fresh air and sunshine that boosts our mood as well. Uh, moving, being physically active, uh, fills that time and is a healthier stress reliever. Instead of eating, exercising is a much healthier option. Um, and moving on to the second barrier, I wanted to mention is um, the disparities that might be in, especially in our Fresno County community. This wouldn't be a public health um, webinar without discussing community or health disparities. So I'm just going to touch on that. Um, we know and we are, we are learning that COVID affects disproportionately and with severe outcomes more of the elderly, the underrepresented minorities, especially those with comorbidities, as Karen had discussed earlier. Um, COVID specifically challenges the immune system. We're learning that, um, and especially with these vulnerable groups. So minorities have more barriers in our area, in, this, in the Central Valley, 
um, with limited access to healthy food and nutrition education. Um, the National Institutes of Health have released several articles on how environment is a huge determinant for one's ability to access and consume healthy food. And right now, especially during this time, it's important to bring that to the forefront for these communities, especially who may not normally afford um, healthy and nutritious food. So I'm going to share my screen real quickly with a slide that I think has some good, there we go, disparities in COVID-19. So just looking at how environment, um, social determinants of health influence severe outcomes of COVID-19, a lack of access to healthy foods, low quality nutrition, higher rates of food insecurity, higher prevalence of obesity and chronic diseases are typically outcomes of this, um, all of which are responsible for increased morbidity and mortality from COVID-19, especially in our disadvantaged populations. And this diagram um, was pulled off from a, a recent article published in the, the Journal of Medicine, of England Journal of Medicine. Okay, let me get back to my notes. Cool. So if we're looking at um, what the National Institute of Health is recommending is to really uh, recognize the disparities that might be in our communities um, and unite for a vision of creating a more healthy, just, and equitable nation. So building or supporting a healthy community, starting with yourself and your household, um, is crucial to combating uh, COVID-19 as a whole. So I'm going to show you in a second a couple of uh, local resources in Fresno County, of which if food insecurity um, is present in your household, reach out to these organizations. Um, or if this is an opportunity to support these organizations who are helping out our community, um, that would also be much appreciated to help combat COVID-19. Let's see. There we go. So Fresno Area Food Resources, um, Central California Food Bank, the Fresno Economic Opportunities Commission, known um, more commonly as EOC. We have the Fresno State Student Covered for Fresno State undergraduate and graduate students. Um, there's St. Martha's Pantry, Clovis. School-aged children from K through 12, they currently have a program, if you're not already aware of it, it's called Grab and Go, and it's for breakfast and lunch every single day of the week, Monday through Friday, 9, through, 9 a.m. Uh, to 11 a.m. So visit your Unified School District website for um, specific location information on that. And I do believe these links um, and slides will be available to you after the webinar as well in case you want to visit these resources. So that concludes our presentation regarding nutrition and COVID-19. Um, I hope it was informative. I hope you have gotten some good ideas about um, healthy options to try at home. And I hope we've created some awareness on how um, self-care and taking care of um, your immune system is really important um, within your household, but then also at the community level too. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to Rebecca. Great. Thank you, Irene. Um, this, was, this was wonderful. Very informative. Um, I would like to probably send some questions your way. We've got quite a few questions. Um, as far as, so we've got Dr. Mary Garza here. Let's see. That one. Go. Okay. So, uh, what are your thoughts on supplements, um, for example, airborne, to boost the immune system? Um, I mean, um, yes. Yeah. Really good question. So, Karen touched on supplements, right? If we are having a balanced diet, um, a daily multivitamin um, would be what is more recommended at this time. Um, and Karen, do you have anything specific with 
um, a supplement such as like airborne or maybe those the vitamin C um, supplements. I think you may need to unmute it, Karen. I think she's still muted. <laughs> okay, let's see. Oh, um, there you go. most, I mean, most uh, supplements don't, don't really work. Uh, it's best to get the, your, that nutrient from foods. The FDA doesn't approve supplements, so there has to be clinical trials like everything else where you have a control group and you have an experimental group and you give one group the placebo and one group the experimental and see if there's any difference. Um, and that rarely happens with supplements. So uh, I haven't, um, I mean, it's always good to eat foods that are rich in vitamin C, uh, whatever nutrient is that you're talking about, try to get it first from food. Uh, and then if you want to take a supplement, yeah, you have to be careful though. Sometimes supplements can interact, uh, a nutrient. Let's say if you take a zinc supplement and you take too much of it, it'll interfere with copper absorption and copper is a mineral that we need in micro amounts, but it can, um, affect the balance of, of nutrients. Uh, and then, you know, consider the cost. I'd rather eat more food, uh, than take a vitamin. You know, I'd rather spend the money on food than on vitamins. So that's what I have seen and heard read so far. Um, do you, Karen, do you have a, a minimum, um, define a minimum, what's your minimum for alcohol intake? Okay, well, the CDC uh, suggests one, two, Two drinks for a male, a man, and but they, they would be uh, measured, you know, six ounces of wine, a shot of, uh, of a, a liquor, uh, one beer or two beers, but max of two. Uh, but, you know, not just filling up your glass and, you know, to the top. So it will be a six ounces of wine, a 12 ounce beer and a shot of, of some kind of liquor. So up to two for men and one for women every uh, you know, uh, every day you could have one. And wine is probably better because it has uh, it's made from grapes and grapes have resveratrol in them, which is a really potent antioxidant. So if you're gonna drink, try wine, red wine. <laughs> mm -hmm. Irene, uh, we, if we are limited in the availability of diverse, healthy foods, what are the items we should prioritize, say, you live in a food desert? Um, do you have any recommendations? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, and that's the reality for the um, majority of our community at times. So as I mentioned earlier, um, if we can avoid junk food, not necessarily focusing on you know, making sure we're eating all the fruits and vegetables that is recommended, but trying to limit the amount of junk food and the processed food, the sweets, those types of foods um, would be priority. And then once we can achieve that, I would start looking more towards adding fruits and vegetables in any way possible um, at for even in food deserts, we can find fruits and vegetables, um, whether they be frozen, whether they be just about to expire in the stores that are at a more affordable cost, um, I would go with that. So if I had to recommend two points would be to avoid the, the junk food and sweets as much as possible, and then to find the most affordable food option for fresh fruits and vegetables or frozen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so Karen, uh, you mentioned the importance of fiber. How much and, and how much do you recommend regarding soluble and insoluble fiber daily? Uh, I would I'm not sure. I'd have to look it up, but I think it's about 40 um, 25 to 40 grams of fiber a day. 
it really depends on um, how much you can eat. You know, it fills you up. The fiber really fills you up. Uh, but I, I have to double check that to get yeah. give from men and women. I do believe it ranges, and um, well, with sol there's soluble and insoluble fiber, and a whole grain food typically contains both. Um, soluble fiber is more beneficial for um, like digestion in our gut, and then insoluble fiber is also beneficial. Um, and it, the first thing that comes to mind is like help softening our stool. So with everything, um, having fiber, con fiber in any amount in our foods would be beneficial. Yes, and if you're eating a good amount uh, uh, daily of fresh or frozen fruits and vegetables and whole grains uh, and legumes, you're, you're going to get enough fiber, you know, without having to you know, add it up. So, but if you're eating uh, foods that are more processed and, and you're limiting fruits and vegetables and whole grains, you're, you're not going to get enough fiber and you're going to know it usually because your stools like, you know, are hard and, um, they, you know, they're not, they don't pass easily. That's usually when people notice not getting enough fiber. So are there any vegetables that you highly recommend uh, as far as high, high in fiber? Oh, well, um, leafy greens uh, are high in fiber, um, mangoes, um, they're all high. They all have good amounts of fiber in them. Just make it a variety and very colorful uh, fruits and vegetables, and you should automatically get enough fiber. Um, can you think of any particular, I mean, leafy greens? I would just recommend eating the skin. So if it's an apple, yeah. you know, eat the skin, don't peel it. Um, right. whole, like grapes, anything that has like a skin that you can consume has tons of fiber in it. Right. Even sweet potatoes, you can eat the skins of sweet potatoes, mm -hmm. uh, regular white potatoes, you can eat the skins. And then you're going to get fiber also from, um, your uh, whole grains, your cereals and breads. If you buy whole grains, you know, where it says 100% whole wheat or 100% whole oats, you're going to get lots of fiber that way. Yes. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Any more questions from our audience today? So we want to thank you all for coming and thank you, Irene. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Dr. Perez. Um, this has been uh, a wonderful webinar. And uh, Dr. Perez, do you have any closing remarks? I'd just like to thank the panelists for a really, really informative session. Uh, very much. I learned quite a few things, and I look forward to counting the two of you for a future intervention with, with our students. Um, again, Rebecca, thank you so much for moderating and the the panel and doing such a great job to those who participated as well. Uh, do take the time to complete the um, evaluation that you're going to be receiving and provide us with some recommendations for future topics for webinars. Uh, last but not least, I wanted to share two resources that I posted in the chat room that address the questions that you were asking about Fiverr. And the second one from the USDA, from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, actually has links to a list of foods that would have some specific nutrients. That was one of the last questions that was posed to the panelists. So once again, thank you very much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, guys. Thanks. It was fun.